Okay, so differentiable inductive logic program. So this is, a, I think, a, a very interesting topic. Inductive logic programming deals with learning a logic program, so learning a set of rules from data. And there was work before inductive logic programming where rules were learned from data, and these were things like FOIL, a priori, that had much more of a data mining feel. And really, it started with this guy, uh, Stephen Muggleton, out of the UK, and his approach was, hey, none of this other stuff that's learning rules is really learning a logic program. So there's no guarantees of entailment or consistency or anything like that that we care about. There's no notion of um, inference steps. So you, there's no idea you, uh, when you do something with the a priori algorithm, there's uh, no intuition that the rules you learn would be the same as if you support multiple steps of inference. And so he approached it in a more principled way and kicked off uh, a new subfield of AI called inductive logic programming. Differentiable inductive logic programming is using a gradient based approach to learn the logic program in a way that also handles noisy data. Traditionally, inductive logic programming has involved uh, really dealing with the classical logic case. And here, uh, one of the main contributions was to extend it to the fuzzy logic case. So here's a brief overview of what we're going to talk about. I'll give a little bit of background on ILP, uh, particularly as it relates to the uh, paper we're discussing. Then I'll talk about uh, ILP uh, by solving satisfaction problem, which is also the overall approach they take. And then I'll get into some details on the neural architecture. I'll talk about the shortcomings of this approach, which are primarily around complexity in terms of the number of weights you need in this neural architecture. And then I'll finish up with the experiments. All right, so a little bit of background in ILP. And so what we have here is we're assuming a first order logic and we have predicates. Uh, if we have, and we have a set of constants and, and we have a set of variable symbols, an atom formed with predicates and constants is ground, with variable symbols is non-ground. We have rules that are of the form if P of X, then Q of X, and that's an example of a non-ground rule. Uh, we have uh, facts, and we also, so everything here has been really right in line with um, the logic intro I gave a couple months back, except there is a limit on the number of inference steps. And this is a little bit of a departure. Um, whereas with classical logic and generalized annotated programs and all that stuff, when they have the fixed point operator, they're just going to keep applying that fixed point operator until you reach convergence. Here it's a little different. We're saying, hey, we have this uh, parameter T, not to be confused with the fixed point operator T, it's a different context here. Uh, we're only going to apply, we're only going to take T number of inference steps. Okay, now, practically, there's an obvious reason for this. And that is, if you want to learn logical rules correctly and consider multiple inference steps, you essentially have to replicate your neural architecture once for each inference step. And if you remember, in the classical case, the number of applications of the fixed point operator would be, uh, you would guarantee convergence in the number of ground atoms because each application of the fixed point operator, if it doesn't change any ground atoms, it's done. So it always has to change at least one. And changing one, you know, is the very minimum. So you could have N, where N is the number of ground atoms applications. Now, if you're dealing with the fuzzy case, actually going to be much more 
because now you have real values in the interval zero one associated with each ground atom. So now each ground atom, that real value can change by whatever the smallest amount it can change by. And so usually that's going to be based on the number of bits you're using to represent that number. So that's going to be a lot if you let it go to convergence. So for purposes of this, and as you'll see when we talk about complexity, is there already is like a really extensive neural structure. And they just say, well, we're only going to allow for so many different steps. Now, one thing that I think would be interesting for future work that I haven't seen anyone talk about yet is if you contrive a problem where you know it's going to take multiple inference steps and you learn it with only a small number, will it still be accurate when it's applied to an instance that requires more? And this is, you know, you could probably come up with this on your own. There could be cases where the training samples may only require a small number, maybe a couple of the train samples might require more than T, but they only go to T, but maybe that's good enough. We don't know. Um, I think there wouldn't be a theoretical argument for that, but there probably could be some strong empirical evidence. It seems like you probably don't need to build out the neural structure for the theoretical would, would be my intuition. I don't know. All right, so in their architecture, um, you know, they say predicates can have up to two arguments. So they limit that. Uh, this is the same limitation that is applied to deep ontological nets from a couple of lessons ago, that Professor Samari. Uh, now we have um, a new definite, new. Uh, modification to the definition of predicates, we have this idea of an extensional predicate. This means an extensional predicate can never be inferred from a rule, okay? So we could think of that be something like, um, you know, we're on planet Earth or we're in Arizona maybe, and we're only reasoning about us while we're in Arizona. Something that instantiates the problem as part of your facts, but never changes. Intentional predicate that may appear in the rule now. Okay. Some of the intentional predicates can be what we call invented predicates. One of the big things with inductive logic programming is because, unlike you know the traditional data mining rule learning, we're supporting multiple steps of inference. If we allow for predicates to be invented that can help us solve the problem along the way because we can infer these maybe latent things that we don't quite know what they are, but it puts a symbol there for us. And it'll use that in the next step of inference to draw a conclusion. And this provides a lot of flexibility in combining rules in different ways. Finally, we have target predicates, and that's what we're looking to predict. So because this is a gradient-based approach, using training samples, we have a loss function. And so we have to decide what that loss function is with respect to, and so the target predicate is what we pick for that. Notice the target predicate is clearly going to be intentional, but not all intentional predicates will be target predicates. I can have other intentional predicates, but maybe I don't care if there's a little bit of inaccuracy uh, in in, when those things are concluded, provided that the target uh, is properly concluded. And you could imagine cases like this where maybe there's some intermediate intentional predicates that in some samples I observe, maybe others I don't. Uh, and I want to consider it when that information is there, but I don't necessarily need to include it in the loss. Okay. So an inductive logic programming problem. So we have a tuple, consists of three things. Uh, B is a set of facts. P is a set of positive uh, ground atoms. 
n is a set of negative ground atoms. And so notice that those ground atoms in P and N, they're all formed with the target predicate. Now we are doing the first order logic case. So while we, uh, in this paper, I think they only predict one target predicate and everything they do, there are still multiple ground atoms associated with that target predicate, okay? So maybe we want to predict, you know, people wearing hats. And it could be any number of us who wear hats. And it's going to make an individual prediction for each. So this is essentially specifies a rule. And the solution is a set of rules such that the rules union with the, uh, uh, with the uh, uh, knowledge base, the basic facts, entail everything in positive and do not entail everything in the negative sense. And so this is the definition of the solution. Now, what this leads to traditionally in inductive logic programming is a little bit of brittleness because of course the real world has noisy data. And if you find something that for one tuple this is precisely there may be another tuple that just has that one extra ground in, that one guy that's wearing a hat that for no reason in the data set, we could you know, create a rule about. But he just happened to do that to screw everything up. And so you know, that's where you run into trouble. Now also note that for a tuple, from a machine learning standpoint, we can think of that as an individual sample. Later in the talk, we'll see how the authors do something that's really interesting in training their model. When they do their batches uh, in uh, stochastic gradient descent, they take sample constants out of the samples. So that extra step I thought was really interesting. And the reason they did this is they claim that it increases the generality of the model. And if you think about it, you can understand that intuition. 